All right. <laughs> There's a reason why I am smiling like the Cheshire Cat today. I have not seen my good friend who was part of Little Italy in Towers Jail almost 20 years ago. And there is a character in Hard Time called Paulie brace, uh, based on my friend here, whose nickname back then was Bruno in, in the jail system. Bruno has got a hell of a story. I saw him in action. He was not a man to be messed with. He was doing some enforcement work for Little Italy in the jail where there was all kinds of drama and violence and mayhem. And he was keeping people in order for Little Italy. So, wow, much love and respect, brother, after all these years. I cannot believe you found me. Same here. Much love and respect there, England. I miss you, man. Yeah. You great. If you get out to London, oh, that would be phenomenal. And how, Yo, how, how did this come about? Tell the viewers how this came about, our reunion. Well, uh, my wife and I were watching the Vice Channel, and uh, we were watching, I was a teenage felon, and there pops up my buddy Sean, and uh, <laughs> telling, telling my wife, I said, wow, that's my buddy Sean. She's like, no, he isn't. You don't know that guy. And I said, well, let's reach out to him, and we'll see. <laughs> So we're going back to 2002 now. Sheriff Joe Arpaio's jail, Ooh. hardcore place run by racial gangs. What, because I, I know a lot of your story, but I'm going to ask you these questions so that the viewers who are not aware of your story can get all of the details. So just take your time answering them. What led to you ending up in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's Towers Jail in 2002? Well, unfortunately, uh, I struggled with drug addiction my whole life. And uh, I ended up in Arizona running from somewhere. I couldn't even tell you what state. Um, and uh, I was out there dealing methamphetamine and, you know, using as much as I was dealing and uh, started messing around with the checks and the credit cards. And uh, I got... Uh, I got into making checks and things of that nature. And when they finally caught me, I ended up like 107 checks at $240,000. So they hit me up with uh, fraudulent schemes and theft and larceny and uh, a whole laundry list of, of uh, you know, charges. How did they catch you? Well, um, Apparently, I wasn't as smart as I thought, which we're, we never are. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was going to Lowe's and Home Depot and, you know, big, big stores. And uh, I was running the checks and taking, taking the uh, stuff I was getting over to um, a fence, you would say, you know, somebody who bought all my stuff. And I didn't realize that I was being recorded and pictures taken of me because when I received my discovery, uh, it was kind of hard to dispute that it was me sitting there smiling at the camera, writing the checks. So. <laughs> yeah, I got caught that way. Scottsdale PD had uh, this one detective. His name was Detective Arnold that uh, grabbed my case. And I guess he chased me for about from about January to September of 2002. And when he finally, hey, Bruno, how you doing? And, you know, he was giving me the whole, uh, I'm glad I finally get to meet. Yes, yeah, me too. And uh, so that's how I am there. And your first day in Sheriff Joe Pyro's jail, did you go through the horseshoe? Oh, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, everybody went through that uh that horseshoe um that was that was an eye opener because um i've never in my life i mean i've been to a lot of jails unfortunately and uh i've never in my life saw the squalor and just the filth and garbage and you know and that's just talking about the food um you know everybody around you is just the dregs of society and unfortunately you know, it's an experience that I'll never forget. What food did they give you in the horseshoe? Oh, you know what they gave me? They gave me the green bologna. 
they gave me the business. But, you know, not like you. I ate it as much as I could because I was starving when I – I think that's what – I think that's – he plays psychological warfare with you, you know, making you starve and stink and, you know, doesn't do anything for you. So everybody's so quick to like, oh, get me out of here. I'll take 20 years, you know. What was it like when you saw the judge when you were in the horseshoe? Uh, it was, it was, it was pretty quick. Um, if I'm, if I remember correctly, uh, two people started fighting in the back of the courtroom. I think somebody stepped on somebody's foot or farted or something at them, or I, I don't know what happened, but, um, they took us in, you know, how it goes. They take you in out of one room and then they put you in another room. And, uh, it was like, uh, it was like a false start in football. You know, we went in, then they threw us all out. They did it again. And, uh, you know, when they told me my bail, which, if I remember correctly, was like 10000 for each charge. And this this Scottsdale cop made sure I wasn't going anywhere. Plus, I I couldn't afford it anyway. But uh, it was really it was pretty quick, you know, and they were like, OK, time for you to go. And that was the end of that. So in that last room in the horseshoe, then, where they classify you, where did they classify you to in the beginning so in the beginning, they sent me to Durango jail, which was the minimum because my charges weren't violent. They were pretty much all white collar. And I lasted about six hours in there because the first <laughs> minute I walked in, first minute I walked into this room I was supposed to sleep in, uh, there was like eight guys in there and uh, the filth was just unbelievable. And, and I looked around. Somebody said something to me, out they got knocked. And uh, from there, immediately, I went to the hole in Durango Jail. And then they sent me over to Towers. What was the hole in Durango Jail like? Oh, it was, uh, well, I got to tell you, it was quiet. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely an eye opener because they had, you know, cameras in there and the room was about that small. Filth, like you couldn't believe, Sean. Well, you know, you, you, you've, uh, you've experienced it. But just the amount of filth, you can't, you know, the, the mat, this thin, and it was just disgusting. Uh, up until but, this point, uh, then. Up fortunately, until... it didn't keep me over there that long. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, okay. So then um, tra what was the transportation like to Towers? Were you in the, in the van? No, nah, they put me in one of those big buses. Um, I guess they were doing their last round, you know, from dropping people from court and bringing people back, whatever. So they took me on the big bus and they dropped me at Towers Jail. And uh, there was another there was another holding cell down there. Um, it was like three or four cells, if I'm, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And um I ended up staying in there like a day and a half, Sean, before they could figure out where to put me because they were trying to charge me for the fight in Durango. So they kind of let me marinate a little bit, and, you know, let me think about it. <laughs> well, which tower did you go to first? Um, okay, so I went to Tower, tower 4, I think, and... Uh, yeah, I think it was Tower 4. Unfortunately, Sean, it's so hard for me to remember everything, you know. But uh, I went to Tower 4. They put me in uh, in a pod over there. I remember what happened. They put me in a pod over there. And, um, you know, I started to settle in a little bit. I started to realize what was going to happen to me, which I wasn't going anywhere for any time soon. And I don't know if you remember the fans that they had in the uh, in the pod. You know, they had that one big fan on the wall above the phone. There was a guy in there. Uh, I think he was a Mexican dude. And uh, I was on the phone. And it was so loud that I pulled the plug out so I could hear, you know. He kept plugging the plug back in. Well, you know what happened there. I don't, I don't have to tell you. So that was my first trip to the hole. And uh, after that, they put me in Tower 6. I'm pretty sure we went to Tower Six at back. That's what it was. The hole was in Tower Six. I think that's where I ended up. You were opposite me when I was in Tower Six, I think. And that's then some right. of the, some of the people who came out the hole in Tower Six, they put them in with us. 
Correct. But, 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 but for the public then, who don't understand yeah. what a tower is and what a pod is, can you describe how, how the building is arranged? Oh, absolutely. So when you walk in, uh, they open up the doors and there's like a guard, a guard like... Uh, it's a tower where the guards sit and they could pretty much, it's like got windows all around it and they could see in each pod. If I'm not mistaken, there was four pods in, uh, in the tower and they're pretty much just like in a circle. And you have, as soon as you walk in, everybody from every pod can see exactly who's walking in. And of course they're like, hey, you got cigarettes, hey, you got dope, hey. You know, so everybody's on the window screaming at you. And um, I'm in handcuffs on my way into the hole. And uh, that's, that's what you get when you walk in. It's, uh, you know, everybody, you can see everybody in each pod in the tower. And how are the inmates divided racially? Explain that for the public, because it blows their minds. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... You got the Woods, you got the, uh, you got the uh, Chicanos, you got the Pisces, you got the, uh, you got the Blacks who are, uh, you know, I, it, it, the funny thing about that is, Sean, I was telling somebody the other day, I don't remember what I was talking about, but, uh, you know, all the, all the Black guys um, on the streets, they're, you know, they got their separate gangs and everything, and, you know, they're pretty much killing each other until they walk through the door of Sheriff Joe's jail. And they all, you know, joined together because there's not very many of them there. I don't know how it is now, but back when we were there, uh, you know, they all banded together. So you, you had basically that four, um, that four, you know, factions of that. And obviously, you know, the Brotherhood was with the white boys and uh, the MA and, you know, those Pisces were the Border Brothers, if I don't, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they had uh you know, they, they had their own little thing going on. I never really understood those guys, but. So how did you fit into it when you came out the hole? Oh, well, to be honest with you, Sean, um, through my whole ride through prison and, uh, you know, going into the jail system, you know, coming from New York, being Italian and, um, you know, I really, I really didn't get along because I really didn't like anybody. To be honest with you, I didn't like the way they carried themselves. I didn't like the way they talked. I didn't like the way they tried to tell. They basically preyed on their own people. And back in New York, it's not like that. You know what I'm saying? When when you go in somewhere, everybody everybody picks you up because, you know, you're already in trouble. You're already locked up. Why Why try to, you know... Why well, try to make everybody's life worse? You know what I mean? I, I know you saw that as well. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky that Wild Man and a lot of people, my co-defendants were in there with me. I yeah. love that. I love that. <laughs> that, that. That guy, I'm so sorry to hear he passed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was good, man. He was funny. If you think I'm funny, he's funny. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get to that. All right, so you come out the hole. Do you remember which tower you went to? I'm pretty sure I went to Tower 6. Uh, I don't. I don't, Sean. I might have went to 6. I might have went to 4. I think they put me right into 6 after I got out of the hole because it was right there. How long was it before you got out the hole that Little Italy formed? Well, now you're, you're getting back to stuff that I, I want to get this right because I don't want to be. So when I came out of the hole, um, I ended up, oh, this is what happened. I ended up, I didn't realize Gerard Gravano was in the, in the jail. Sammy the Bull's son, just like, yeah, for people. Right, yeah. Sammy yeah. the Bull's son. So I didn't know him personally, but we were at visit, and Roscoe and I, um, I think we were waiting to come back, and Gerard was there as well, so we started talking, and he knew, um, uh, I, I know you don't know my background, but, you know, growing up, I worked for, you know, a bunch of guys out in, out in Brooklyn. And uh, long story short, we kind of kind of meshed a little bit. And Roscoe and uh, Carlo, Carlo. Let me just let me just tell people. And so if people have read Hard Time, Roscoe is Marco in Hard Time. 
right, and right. Carlo is Hugo in Hard Time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, you, you, you were so talking. The, you were uh, talking to Gerard. Yep. Right, and uh, Roscoe Roscoe said, "Let's just let's just get together, man, and just buck this whole thing." Because we started talking about how everything was running there, and you know what kind of people we were dealing with, and you know we just kind of we just kind of bonded immediately. And um, on a side note, I just found him. Uh, Roscoe, and I'll tell you about that. No here way! <laughs> no good. No good. What? No good. He, what do you mean, no good? He's not. He's not free. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about that more. But oh, so we shit. ended up. Yeah, we ended up. Um, we ended up just you know it was on the premise of hell with these guys. We're gonna do what we want. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, the hell with the yeah. Aryan Brotherhood guys. Exactly, and, and you know what, <laughs> Roscoe. Every, a lot of people didn't notice about him. This kid was like five foot six. He didn't really have nothing to look at, but I'll tell you what, this kid was a fighter. And anybody who wanted to try him made a big mistake. Yeah, and this is this is where the, this is where this am I right? I mean, this is where the story gets really interesting because when people when people hear this story and they know that the AB runs the entire system, they're like, "How did this small group of Italian guys take over that building when the AB runs the entire system?" This is just not fucking possible. Well, I watched it with my own eyes. You guys, <laughs> the magic. You guys just. Oh, it was it was the best time in the in the, in my entire incarceration. It was my best time when you were running the building. But, but yeah, sorry, keep keep going. You you spoke to Gerard, and then what happened? So um, it was just to answer your question there, Sean. It was brute violence, is what it was. <laughs> um, brute force, trauma, whatever you know. But. Uh, no, uh, you know, we talked to each other and we made sure because, you know, Gerard wasn't having a very good time there because of who he was and who his dad was. And we just thought that was ridiculous that everybody wanted his head on a platter because of who his father was. You know what I mean? doesn't matter what you did out there. You know what I mean? But, oh, this guy's a piece of shit because he's this. Come on. That's just, you know, that's that's ridiculous. I, I We just thought that everything that was going on in there and everything that was, you know, all the premises and all the, Oh, don't talk to that guy. and Don't, don't eat with this guy and don't, don't do this. Uh, was ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, nothing in that system, Sean, makes sense to anybody. You know what I mean? Anybody who's listening, that's never been there will never understand. Like, what is this guy talking about? No, I'm telling you. It's a different world with different rules, and we just weren't having it. So what what did you put into play to uh, change those rules? Well, I know, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, every time we went out to visit, we got kind of, you know, confronted. And, you know, it was, it was basically like, oh, well, Whenever you want to, you know, whenever you want to change things, come on and uh, see if you could do it. And um, it just played out from there. You know, we uh, we just uh, Roscoe had a lot of pulp, man. And um, I never he, saw anything like it in my entire incarceration. He had the most pull out of anyone I ever saw. And there was a reason behind that. And, you know, I know you touched on it in your book a little bit, but. You know, when you're when you're related to somebody in that stature, you know what I mean? Uh, people on the outside know they're like, mm, OK, maybe, uh, you know, this guy is, you know, exactly what he's what he's saying he is. And, you know, because everybody who goes in jail, Sean, they, they you know, they can make up whoever. The, oh, I did this. I did that. And ninety nine point nine percent of the people are full of shit. You know, bottom line, you know. I'd look out my window at night when, when we were all locked down and Roscoe, a.k.a. Marco, would be out there with the guards giving them orders and he moved all my co-defendants into my cell. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, was, it was uncanny because, it, it, you know, uh, 
you know, you, it's sometimes you, you know, you don't want to ask questions and, uh, you know, he just had it like that. And, uh, he was, uh, he was great. He was great for us because I know you touched on, you touched on a lot of stuff in your book, man, that I didn't even remember. And, uh, we pretty much had whatever we wanted and it just made our time a little bit easier and a little more calmer knowing, like, like when you hit on, you know, when, when he became the head of uh, our area, you know, I know, you know, because you wrote about it and uh, everybody just lived. Nobody bothered anybody. Nobody, nobody was like, oh, you know, check this guy's paper. Obviously, if you're coming in, you're a sex offender or you're a child molester, you're not going to stay. That's anywhere in the world. But as far as, you know, just running over our people for no reason, he never did that. All right, so let's 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 just go before Little Italy established itself in my uh, pod. What what happened? What what dramas or anything did you go through before you arrived in my pod? I fought every day. Every day you were fighting. Every every day, you know, uh, somebody come in to me and tell me, uh, yeah, you know, you can't sit over here. Make me not sit over here. You know what I mean? Make me not talk. You know, growing up in New York, Sean, I, I, I know you know this. It's a melting pot, man. Uh, my brother-in-law's cousin, he's the ex-featherweight champ of the world. He's a black guy. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but my baby's mother, she was a Mexican girl from California, you know? And um, when you're telling me something, you better be preaching it. And I'll let you, I'll tell you a little story about what happened when I first got to prison and uh, it'll to make total sense to you. Nobody's going to tell me to be a racist. Nobody's going to tell me to be the way they are just because they think they're, you know, better than me or whatever it is. So I didn't have a very, I didn't have a very smooth ride, you know what I mean? Because I just didn't believe in all the bullshit and all the rules and, you know, everything like that. So they were coming up to you daily, just uh, sweating you over stupid shit. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'd sit and I'd talk to a guy who happened to be a Mexican dude. Hey, Bruno, come on in here, man. We need to talk to you. And, you know, that whole three or four guys standing by the door and somebody telling me something, I'll point to him. Like, I am worried about you dudes here. You might as well send them out because they're going to get hurt too. You know what I mean? So that's the way it pretty much went in the jail. Uh, you know, it was ridiculous, Sean. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. I, had the same, I had the same thing. I was working out with Sniper, a La Victoria gang member. And they're like, hey, Wood, can we have, you know, yeah. come over, you know, kind of thing. And it's three guys in the doorway. Yep. And um, they're like, look around the day room. You see any, on, any other Woods working out with the other races? Right. You got a right. lot to learn, Wood. <laughs> That's the, that's the mentality. That's the pack mentality. I know you know this. You're, you're very, you're, I always told you, Sean, you were the smartest guy I knew. And that pack mentality, you know, when you get them alone and, you know, if the three guys aren't standing by the door and you walk in and close it, boy, the whole tune and the whole, the whole ambiance of the cell starts to calm down and it starts to be like, hmm, wait a minute. This guy just shut the door on me. What you know? Maybe maybe he ain't playing. <laughs> you know? um, so so I take it then that you went the hole and then you ended up in my pod. Yes, sir. All yes, right. Sir. So when you was in the pod, then um, had you been with Marco and Hugo before you came to the pod? Is that where you first clicked up with them? Only only a visit. Um, visit. I never I never knew Carlo. Um, when Rosco introduced me to him, um, he was a character, man. You, you could have wrote a whole book about that guy. I mean, that guy, I think he was a little off as well. And when you, when you mentioned that he used to write his wife with, uh, with his blood, I remember that. And I was, <laughs> I, I was reading this book. I was reading this book and, and my wife left me to go to bed. And I'm sitting out here just hysterical laughing. And he's like, what are you listening? <laughs> I read that book in one night, Sean. Holy shit. I couldn't put it down, bro. <laughs> All right, because so. I'm going to tell you, viewer, everything you said there is true. 
Thank you, man. We get so many people saying, oh, this is made up. It's going to be possible. Book. Yeah, no. Everything yeah. you said in that book happened. And Thank it was you. true. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm here to tell you. Absolutely. All right. So you're in, you're in my pod. And then yeah. all of a sudden, Little Italy forms in the pod. How did you guys all end up in that cell together? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So... Roscoe did his thing, and uh, we wanted the best cell in the house, which was away from everybody in the corner. And I know you missed this in the book, but I'm going to let you know. Do you remember Curian? Say that again. Big Cur Black. Curian. Curian. They called him Q. Q I, I remember a guy called Q, yeah. He was our bodyguard. Don't you remember we used to have him standing outside the, the cell all day? <laughs> but anyway uh, yeah we picked, we picked i don't know if you remember there was people living in that cell roscoe had him thrown out we had a cleaning crew come in <laughs> clean up and then we all got into 15 because it was up in the corner yeah yeah all i remember is all of a sudden there's like a click of italians in the corner <laughs> all friends all together that that just does not happen like wild man, we had do not house together. So they, they, he was put in a different tower. All of a sudden, yeah. three guys who were friends in a cell together. Rumors are just going around. Who the fuck are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was definitely all Roscoe, and uh, you know he got us. I, I know you remember we used to do it for you too. We used to get new clothes every couple of days because. Uh, I know uh, people don't know they they would give you new laundry that was I don't know if you're shit stained boxers and you know just it was disgusting in there man I mean I don't know how they got away with it Sean and you know it was just horrible man so you know Roscoe used to go to the laundry laundry guys and say hey let's get new clothes for all of our friends you had them i know you did i remember you did well when he invited me to start working out with you guys i knew i was in then and uh, that, that was fun <laughs> you want to tell tell the public how we used to work out what we used to use oh yeah we used to uh we used to make water bags and uh we used to get garbage bags with you're al weren't allowed to water candles to do, do curls and uh we used the mop bucket we used to work out on the stairway you know doing our pull-ups and our push-up we did on the uh on the table we just all uh immediately just loved you bro you know what i mean we uh we used to talk about, I was like, I wish there was a fourth bunk in here because I want England up here. Oh, us. thank you, you know? man. No, it was the truth. And um, so, you know, we knew you didn't, you, you never belonged there, Sean. You know what I'm saying? We, <laughs> we knew that you were the educated, you know, smart dude. And uh, we just, we had nothing but love and respect for you immediately. And, you know, we, we figured, you know, envelop this guy, man. This guy is, uh, this guy is the fruit of the loin here, man. We, we just loved you, bro. Yeah, you guys definitely looked out for us. And yeah. so many ways, you're like, the, the fresh laundry, like you said, uh, the, the visits that were extended for me and my girlfriend. Oh, and yeah. man, it, on and on with the perks of... of, of but, but when you guys first moved in, the yeah. ABs were running that pod. So yeah. right away, yeah. did that beef regenerate with you guys in the ABs? Did you come up with a strategy to take over? Now, I don't think it was a strategy. I think uh, I don't remember the dude's name, but what, there was there was some kind of a riot that happened. And um, I know there was a big deal. But the problem was, Sean, after we after we had that spot, uh, the few people that were left in the other towers uh, from, you know, the brotherhood and everything, they uh they started talking to us and, you know, letting us know, Hey, this is, you know, this is the deal here. And, you know, we'd get our little kites and, you know, all that other stuff. And, um, I, ba I, I think basically they just conceded that, you know, we weren't going nowhere and we weren't, we weren't going to be told anything, you know? So what happens, you know what I'm saying? If you can't move the guy, you know, what do they say? You can't beat him, join him. 
You know what I mean? So I, th- I think the head, the head of the whites got rolled up or moved for some reason. And there right. was a white boy meeting. What, what yeah. happens at the white boy meetings when you have to vote? Well, uh, so basically everybody went in, into the cell. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Sean was in there with us. Um, it was just, um, again, stupid. Uh, the people who were, you know, from prison and, uh, you know, people who've done time. And uh, so it was a vote. It was a vote. Um, you know, we all wanted somebody with a level head, somebody that was smart, somebody that could handle things. And, uh, you know, it was close, but Roscoe got it. I don't remember who was up against him for that, but. Wasn't it skin? Uh, it wasn't it skinhead sure Steve. I, it was, I think it was Steve, skinhead Steve. He had, he had, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, Sean, I don't know how you remember all this. What, what, I, what I did, Bruno, I, I, Bruno, I was writing it all down and, and sending it in letters to my girlfriend. I remember. And she sent me all the letters, and that's how I wrote the book. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I was remembering stuff and I was, I was reading stuff and I was like, how did this guy, you know, like every detail. <laughs> and again, my wife sitting there and she's like, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> but yeah. So that's how, <laughs> that's how it came about. We had a meeting. We had, a, you know, he was the, uh, he was, was gonna get it anyway, you know. Get a box, a box, you know what I mean? But we made it. Hey, yeah. let's vote, you know. Yeah. So, so what? What yeah, does that? So that, was, that was, what? What does that mean? Becoming the head of the white race in in a building like that. What? What power does that give somebody? Well, it's it's all the power. I mean, uh, forget about the power he had before. Um, it's all the power, you know, you get, you get to tell, you know, people do this, do this, do this, do this. And again, um, it didn't really go like that with Roscoe because he didn't need anything from anybody. So I think the atmosphere, once he became, you know, the head, the head is just basically somebody to go to, to make decisions because apparently when everybody goes in the prison, nobody can make a decision for themselves. You know, you don't really need it, unfortunately, but uh, it comes with, it comes with the perks. You get to sit where you want. I mean, it's just, it's kind of ridiculous when, when you're out here in the real world and you're thinking about it. Well, I'm the head of uh you know, I try to tell my wife I got the keys to the yard at this house, and she's like, "Yeah, you ain't that." You know <laughs> <what I> mean? <laughs> your internet is um, you're going a little bit in, in and out because you're into that. Is, is there any other devices uh, in the house you could turn off just to strengthen your signal? I don't. I'm living in the country now, Sean, and what's going on is we don't have Wi-Fi or internet where I live, and. I'm on my personal hotspot because this place in the country, we don't have any fiber set up yet. So I apologize. I hope All right. I no worries. Stuff. No worries. We'll, 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 we'll keep it going. We can still hear you fine. All right. So you guys have, have got control of the pod and then you start to move my co-defendants in, including yeah. Joey Crack, who also is dead. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, he died. He died quite quickly after he got released. I'm sorry to hear that, Sean. Yeah, do you want to do you want to tell the people about me what it was like meeting Joey Crack? Oh, uh, I this kid was he was the funniest. Um, he was such a nice guy, but he was the funniest guy, and you knew you know he was just uh, I, I can't explain it. It's one of those types of people that you meet immediately, kind of like wild man. And you just like him. He, the stories he would tell and just the way he just, uh, he was just awesome to know, you know? Yeah. Cause he used to, you guys used to file into our cell and Joey crack would be telling wild man stories. Oh yeah. <laughs> sure would. Yeah. What wild man. He's another, uh, he's another subject, man. You could do, I think you could have did a book 
on the way that guy was just on your own. You know what I mean? Like the tales of the wild man or yeah, we're, something we're, like that. We're, we're, we're working on that. That will definitely happen. So what was it like meeting Wildman at Catholic Mass? Oh, man. I know I know. you told this story in the book, but you didn't even. I mean, this guy, what he did to that priest, um, he was, I mean, every word that came out of this priest's mouth, Wildman was just, it was, it was, it was almost hard to watch. It was, um, uh, uncomfortable because he was just the type of guy that he didn't care he was a priest and i didn't remember what he did when we got out into the into the into the breezeway there when we came out of the church with him pulling his pants down and that was him though that was that was what he did you know what i mean that was the type of guy he was but he was just i mean he was a scary dude to be honest with you you know what i mean he was he was one of those guys that you never knew what he was going to do how he was going to do it or what he was going to say. So when you had him as your right hand man, that was that was pretty smart, Sean, because uh, <laughs> nobody could figure that guy out. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, he was a good a good guy to get arrested with. If you if your fists aren't as big as yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we are with part two with Bruno. Or if you've read Hard Time, then you know him as Paulie. And Little Italy, the chapter in Hard Time, it was the best time in the jail. If you've watched part one, you're already aware there was this unique period of time in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's dungeons, Towers Jail, where the Italian guys, including Bruno, managed to take control of the building over the Urians, and people say, how is this even possible? Because they run the whole system. Watch part one, read Hard Time, and you will hear exactly how they did this. It was it was finesse and force. A combination of finesse and force, I would I would describe it. We got Marco, who uh, Bruno will, will refer to as Roscoe. We've got Hugo in the book, who... Um, Carlo, Carlo is was what, what, how we referred to him in, in, in the jail, actually. And, and if you watched part one, we left off talking about Bruno's journey through the system and then how he gets moved into my building. We're serving time together in 2002, medium security, Towers Jail. And we left off where Bruno had just met Wildman at the Catholic Mass. And could I, could I, you know, a lot of people in this country respect Wildman Bruno, but some people have said, you know, he, he didn't make his bones in this country. How, how do they know he was a tough guy over in America? What do you say to those people? Well, uh, I'll tell all those people they're full of shit. Um, <laughs> the guy, the guy was a maniac, but a lovable guy all the same and uh to be perfectly honest with you he was very much feared uh regardless of what anybody says um it's funny because you and i have been through it and people who you know want to judge and whatever it is they want to do they're they have no idea this guy was a straight uh tough guy and he had my respect for the minute that I started, you know, started to know him, uh, as well as him having respect for me, you know. Uh, yeah. Wow, wow, he looks so much different. Was he sick, Sean? Yeah, what happened was he got released. That's my wild man, yep. Got there released in, the, in about um, 2008, and he uh, was adjusting. He became my co-host on the podcast and he was loving it. He was really popular. And then towards the end of last year, his, his health problems got the better of him. He died of multiple organ failure and he was up to 29 and a half stone in weight, which um, I think one stone is 14 pounds, 14 times 29.5. 
He was over 400 pounds, six foot two. And during one of the podcasts, he, he was like leaking fluid through his legs. And I said, you know, you need to go to hospital oh. for this. And he was like, oh, it's, it's, it's going to be wild man water. I'm just going to bottle it and bless people with it. So he was joking all the way. And he said he didn't want to go to the hospital because the old people needed the beds because of the, the pandemic. And yeah, it was really sad. He ended up from his house. He just got rushed to the hospital and with breathing difficulties and he died. And his funeral was the end of last year. But he loved you. He had nothing but love and respect for you. Yeah, I remember I was in the mass. Same here. Same here. I, I was in the Catholic mass when you guys first met, and we were all supposed to be quiet. And he's he's whispering really loud. You sat on one side of me. He sat on the other side of me. And you guys shook hands, and it was so powerful. When you guys shook hands, it pressed against my body, and I, I almost flew out of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was some character and he was the sweetest guy I, mean, I i i just have nothing nothing but good to say about him he was uh and for everybody that's listening he made his he made his known and he made it known well yeah and uh marco couldn't move him into my cell because the prosecutor put a do not house but but roscoe had right. marco roscoe had the guards let him visit us, didn't they? He would just come in and visit us for hours and hours on end. And it, yeah, and it was like, I we, we, yeah, oh man, it was so much fun. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was a horrible place, but we just yeah. made, we made the most of it, didn't we? We sure did. And yeah, I remember, I remember he used to have people coming in for visits from other towers and, you know, it was, it was unheard of. <laughs> It was unheard and, of. An inmate yeah. telling the guards, bring that guy from that building into here and just let him hang out for hours on end. It was so cool. All right. So, so, that's what, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's there, was what it a, was. there was a few characters. I'm just going to run them by you and see if you can remember them. There was the skinny kid who guys would okay. pick on, but he was a kickboxer. And it seems like every time he had a fight, he would, he would smash him in, in, I don't know where it was, the knockout button, but they would shit themselves. Do you remember him? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. I do. I don't. I don't remember exactly all of his antics, but I sure remember. Uh, and the funny thing was, is that they knew him all through the jail system too. And even when we, even when I got to, to prison, it was, uh, it was uh, Kyle. And Kyle. Kyle. That's what we called him in the. Was his real thing. name Kyle? I can't remember. I can't remember his real name. Right. I don't remember his name. Yeah. Do you remember him I and can't some... remember his name, but yeah, I sure do remember. Do you remember yeah. him and some skinny kid um, in the day room? They would jump on the tables and do backflips. Some skinny black kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember reading about that in your book and, and everything was coming back to me because, you know, it's been so long, Sean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, uh, would you have remembered, would you have remembered all this? No, if, if you didn't if, write it down. If, if I, honestly, before speaking to you, I had to go back and read it because I'd forgotten it already. And, and how it was remembered was my girlfriend, the blonde who was visiting me at that time, uh, she, uh, I was writing to her every single day. I put all the details of everything, you know, all the dramas. And even though we, we broke up, she, she like sent this massive big box of all these letters when I got released. And that was all the details then for hard time. So thank God she kept those letters. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember yeah. John the Baptist? He was like a hippie and he kept a diamond in his ass. Yep. <laughs> right. And I was telling you before we got cut off the last time, I don't, I don't know if you heard me. I think I remember seeing him when we went away to uh, uh, prison. He was there. Yeah. And, uh, he shaved his head and uh yeah but i remember him. these these were characters you cannot make up sean you they're the guy from the Aryan church and um it was just like the whole vibe as soon as you guys came in it went from this moody place where there was just all these fights and everyone was sweating everyone just to like yeah. like a circus there was like almost a circus atmosphere yeah, in the yeah. in the in the building yeah, 
it was it was it was controlled circuits it was it was it was controlled by us <laughs> and uh you know you look back on it and you think you know it was the worst experience of my life but it ended up to where it was tolerable a little bit you know yeah did you were you there the day that joey crack put a prince albert in his man parts I remember that, and uh, that was, I think he had come out, he was still bleeding, and yeah. he was, like, standing on the stairs showing everybody, Yeah. and I don't know if you remember as well, I don't know if that was him as well, but they were doing, putting beads inside the man parts, I don't know if you remember that as well. Yep, yep. They were breaking, like, chest pieces, I, I don't know what it was, but that was just, yeah, that was, that was hard to look at. He had like chest yeah. pieces in his ears as well, didn't he? And then they, I think it was yeah, Sunny I Slope. I, I think it was Sunny Slope yeah. held, a do, held the door for him as they bent the jewelry. They put his man parts in the door <laughs> and they bent the jewelry and uh, Sunny Slope. And um, Sunny Slope, he had his little hustles, didn't he? Doing laundry and he was, he, he was selling cheese to people. Do you want to tell the viewers a little bit about yeah. Sunny Slope, how we adopted him? Oh my God, that kid was a nightmare when he came in. Uh, he was just, uh, he was the type, of, he was the type of guy that, you know, he was a dumpster diver out there. And, uh, you know, being from the slope over there, he, uh, there was no rules. There was nothing that he wouldn't do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think Roscoe put him to work. He was doing everybody's laundry. He was, uh, you know, cleaning cells and he was doing everything, you know, like, like I, like I touched on in part one, uh, you know, it was all about picking people up and not, you know, making them, uh, you know, less than he wanted to bring everybody to the point where they were all, you know, giving, giving and, you know, making it a better atmosphere. You know what I mean? It was nice to see him thrive, wasn't it? Nice to see him thrive. Nice what? It was nice to see him thriving. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I think I, I think at the time that we were there, everybody was was thriving. You know what I mean? Rather than you know, there was still that atmosphere of oh wow, you know what's going on? Like what you were looking at all that time, and you know what you were going through daily. You know you could see it on your face, Sean. You know you, you know it doesn't matter that you know you had that great attorney and everything, but you knew in your heart, you know you didn't know what was going to happen, and you know it showed. And everybody was the same way, you know. It's the worst thing. Worst of the conditions is not knowing what sentence yeah. you're going to get, isn't it? What What were you facing? What did you say you were facing last time? Correct. And then, well, I ended up, uh, it was forging the scheme, theft, larceny, uh, a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different charges, but I only ended up getting six and a half years. I did, uh, one was something like, Two hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars, and then we went to a restitution hearing and got it down to about thirty-one thousand. And that's a story for you for later on because I just finished paying it. Oh my God! Twenty years ago, and you just finished paying it. Holy shit! Well, it uh, it went it went from here, it went up to here, and yeah. you know it was just uh, I finally had to sell my house. Uh, and then they got theirs. So <laughs> they it turned always... out it was uh, all said and done. It was almost forty nine thousand dollars they ended up getting. Wow, they always get those. Do you remember in the yeah. day room? Because yeah. just just to lay it out for the viewers, then the day room. This this facility is designed for like fifteen guys, but they got three guys in each cell. Then they got these steel octagonal tables bolted to the floor. And you got all the different races right. at all the different tables. There's the fan, there's the little TV, there's the phones. And then, and then someone lobbed a grapefruit. Yep. I think the Mexicans um, lobbed a grapefruit and it hit one of the whites. And then he lobbed it back. I think so. At them, but it missed them and hit the head of the Mexicans. And then Roscoe saw that it was all that. about to kick off. I remember that. Roscoe saw it was all about to kick off and he told the white guy to apologize, but the white guy told him to F himself. 
but he didn't he had yeah. to roll up because yeah. um somebody took care of him <laughs> someone gave him a visit and there was a few yeah, thudding I, uh... <laughs> do you remember that <laughs> There was a few thudding noises. You remember all those thuddings? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's crazy what you remember, Sean. You know. I mean, during during the rule of Little Italy, the violence really was minimized. But when there was no Little Italy, it was almost every day you heard that thudding noise. Was it the same for you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so. I know you touched on it in your book, but after uh, after I came back from visit one day, uh, we had caught a sex offender in the uh, in the visit room, and I ended up handling that. And uh, when I came back, uh, I had got it. I don't remember that woman's name, that guard, but she had it out for us. She hated us, and. Uh, she started telling me something and uh, I got into it with her. And, you know, that's when she made me take my exit. I, I know you hit on that in the book as well, but um, after I went over to Madison, you know, that, that place, it was closed down by that time. Did you, did, did you uh, go any further about that with people? Okay. And um, they had us up on the sixth floor, Sean. And, and uh, I'm telling you, if you thought the whole in, I had to sleep with toilet paper in my ears, my nose, and basically cover up my whole face because the, the amount of vermin and the amount of garbage that was up in that area, because nobody was taking care of it anymore. All they had was the hole, and then they had the dogs. And I woke up, they had me on the loaf program. I know you hit on that. And uh, that was, that was vile in itself. It was just, it was unbearable in there. I was there for like 12 days in that little cell where they had the front door and then they had this just little window. And uh, it was, it was the worst thing that I ever experienced in my life right there. That was bad. Yeah. Tell the people what the loaf is. <laughs> You know, there, back in the day, there was always, uh, there was always, uh, you know, talk about what it was. But from what I understand, it was all the leftover food that they put into some kind of mixer and they added something in it and then they burnt it. And then they served it to you twice a day. So it was like this dense, burnt, nasty thing wrapped in a piece of white paper. And uh, I got that twice a day for 12 days and then uh that was life-changing you know it that, tastes that, like burnt that, that shoe polish really bad it tasted like burnt shoe polish <laughs> yeah. it was supposed to have been vegetables and you know all good stuff for you and uh i think i saw an interview with with our, our pile years later saying yeah i ate it and, and i loved it and <laughs> you know and i know you were talking about the red death and the, and the green death and People just can't even imagine the amount of disgusting we're talking about. They don't think it's real. They like they can't comprehend that this could be possible on Earth. That anyone could be put in that kind of an environment. That it, that environment could be created. But Sheriff Joe Pio, he was a piece of work, wasn't he? Oh, he was. And I, I can't even begin to tell you. He did it on purpose. He was he was a sadistic man. Um, you know, the whole story with, with all the pink stuff, oh, they were stealing it. No, it was to embarrass us. It was to take us from here down to here. He, he, was, a, he was a sadist, and he enjoyed seeing people, you know, uh, suffer. And it came out years later, you know what I mean, that, you know, the guy was just a mess himself. You know, all the stories with, uh, with him being on the take and this and that, but... The thing that the thing that really bugged me was is that anytime that guy walked in the jail, it was like God walked in. And and you know, here's a guy who's got his thumb on us like this, and you know, feeding us basically garbage with dog food and uh, putting us in pink panties and boxes and things like that. And everybody's like, oh, you know, he's here. And I never understood that. I never I never could understand that. 
you know, you would think everybody would try to attack him and, you know, but no, he was like a celebrity walking in there. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so that just goes to show you the mentality of the guys that were running the jail. You know what I mean? Yeah, they were hardcore. So in, in the Madison yeah. Street jail then, yeah. um, the cockroaches, they, they were just all over you at night, were they? Sean, let me tell you something. Like I said, uh, you, you basically you couldn't sleep. I mean, I, I sleep was at a, at a, you basically passed out for a few minutes, maybe an hour tops, you know, but you could feel them crawling on your. So you had one sheet, you know, your, your, whatever you were wearing when you went in there, but the way they, it was infested. And you can't stop that. When you feel something crawling on your head, I don't care if you got a sheet on it at, at, at any point, you know, you're going to wake up. And uh, yeah, so it was basically sleep deprivation slash uh, starvation slash, uh, you know, whatever, whatever else you could call it, Sean. It was, it was definitely mental warfare, you know. Yeah, there came a point after a year in where they doubled my bail bond to 1.5 million. So I ended up doing 14 months in Madison with the cockroaches. Oh, oh man. I don't know how you did it. Yeah, I don't yeah, know how yeah. You, you did it. Yeah. That, that was the most intense. If, if we don't have. That was the most intense um, part of it, I think, with the, with the cockroaches. That, that, you know, you could, you could, you could lay me in a closet. Sean for I'll sit there you know you can put me in my bathroom now in the ha in this house I'm living in and I could live in it you know I, I wouldn't have to come out but when you add cockroaches and disgusting food and you know just basically isolation a lot of people don't realize the amount of mental torture that we go through even now 20 years later you know we're still institutionalized it's never gonna it's never gonna leave us yeah if someone tickles my hand I, I flinch because so many nights I woke up with them tickling my hands and uh, they were trying to get my ears to eat the earwax. And yeah. But, oh yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Like I said, I had toilet paper in my nose, my ears, and the little bit that I kept out to breathe on my nose, you know, it was, it was basically, you know, it was like breathing through a straw. <laughs> you know? <laughs> what about, what about when you came off the loaf program, where did you get housed? Uh, actually they, they kept us, there was one pod in Madison before I came back to towers. I think I went to tower two and, uh, waiting for the, uh, the train to go back to, uh, to prison. And, um, they kept us over there for a little bit and, uh, it was, it was probably the worst, I think it was a day and a half until they can move you back, you know? And uh, same thing, just squalor and, uh, you know, no TV in there because everything was basically stripped from that place by the time, you know, we we're in there. And uh, just waited to go back, ended up in Tower 2 for, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks. I left for, uh, I left for the prison yard at April 3rd of 2003, so. So when you, got, when you got back into the Towers, all of a sudden, didn't, didn't Roscoe, we, we'd moved while you were away, I think, to a different tower, and the Urians had taken oh, over again. The Urians had taken over right. again, so we were, like, back under them. But didn't Roscoe move you and Sunny Slope back in with us for a little bit before you yeah, left? I came back, and then... And then, and then some correct. sergeant that's kept that's moving right. you. Some sergeant kept moving you out, and then he'd move you back and back, and every day it was like tug of war. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, I, yeah. And I think we ended up, I think I ended up leaving there and going to Tower 2, and that's where I left from prison. Because yeah. after I left, uh, after I left you guys, I don't even remember. I, I, it's, it's a blur. You know, it's a blur about, you know. Did you leave before Roscoe left, or did Roscoe leave first? He left before me. He left I think before he left you. Before me, because I I ended up leaving in April. Do you remember all of the um, the day he left? What it was like? 
I don't. I don't think I was there when he okay. left. Okay. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. What happened yeah. was, right, you know, like people have to move to a different building before they go to DOC. They all came and moved everyone, but, right. but didn't, they didn't move him. They, they kept him with us. Then just like days before he's about to go to DOC, they took him and um, he came back. He came back hours later. And everyone was like, yeah, he's back. He's back. And he was, it was. You're right. I do remember that now. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, I yeah. still was there, weren't I? Yeah, yeah I think I so. Remember that. I think so. I remember that. So he, before he was gone, yeah. we were all crying. Yeah. We did this party. And then he comes back and they're all like, yeah, he's back again. But then after he was gone, <laughs> after he was completely gone, the atmosphere just so changed. Just went back yeah. to the same old shit. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, you know, and I bet you could walk in there today and it'll be the same stupidity we went through 20 years ago. So how long did you end up serving totally then? Well, that's where it gets dicey, Sean. Yeah. Um, so prior to, uh, prior to getting uh, my time in Arizona, I had caught a case in Colorado that I didn't, I told you I was moving around from here to there and, so I ended up getting six and a half years in, in, uh, in Arizona. When I got done, I had written, you know, writs and everything to get back to Colorado. And um, so I got back to Colorado. Uh, they let me out sometime in 2008. I think it was April, April of 2008. So I did almost six because, you know, didn't have a very uh, fun time in prison either. And um they took me back there. I had to see a judge and they gave me all my time served for what I did in Arizona. So basically, you know, I saw the judge and he ran all the time because I didn't get out. So they let me out on parole in Colorado. I lasted about 11 months, caught a new case in Arizona probation. So I went and did five more years in Colorado. No. And then guess who was waiting for me when I walked out? So I went back to Arizona no. in 2013. Did another, yeah. Did another seven months and then finally let me out July 22nd of 2014. So throughout your life then, how so many? All that time that I was away from you. How many years total have you served throughout your life? Say again. What's the total uh, years you've served? Prison throughout? time, probably. Probably going to tell you between, let's see, between California, Colorado, Arizona, New York. Probably eighteen years in prison, and, and probably another three years in county jails. Wow. 20 plus. Have you thought about writing a book about your life? You must have so many stories from all those years. Well, I mean, we've only touched on the jail stuff. So um, I have thought about that, but I don't know how to even get started, Sean, because to tell you the truth, if you told me a year, I could probably tell you where I was, but being that, you know, the way I was living life and the way everything played out, I don't remember more than anything. But I don't know if you know this about me. Um, you know, I'm ex-military, I'm ex-army, and I was stationed in Germany. I don't know if we ever talked about that. But when you said in part one, you know, if you ever get to UK before we were recording, uh, I've been to Piccadilly Circus. I've been to England. <laughs> I've been there. I've been to London. And the... Uh, I can't wait to I can't wait to go back because I want to revisit Germany and Italy and you know I was there as a young kid. So, do you think that your criminal record? But I don't know if they'll let me in the country now. Is it? Are you, are you able to get a passport? You know, I think they'll give me the passport, but I also don't know if they'll let me in a country if I get there. See, like I, I know that they sent you back to England. Can you come back here? No, I'm banned for life, and they wouldn't let Mike Tyson in here either. But people like Michael Francis, 
and Johnny Elite. They've been able to get into the UK and do talks of stuff. Did you talk to Michael Francis? Yeah, yeah, he's interviewed me. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's he great is a great guy. guy. He's, uh, his dad was something else. He's an absolute gentleman. Sure is. And that guy, that guy was, you know how I always say you're the smartest guy I know. That guy was the smartest guy the mob ever had. <laughs> I'm going to, after this, <laughs> after this, I'm going to send you the interview that uh, me and Wildman did with John Elite here in London. Right. I think you'll enjoy watching that. He was uh, he was a character in itself. I, I've I've heard of all these guys because you know where I grew up and you know Johnny A Light was uh, he was no joke. Yeah, yeah. And um, have you watched Sammy yeah. the Bull on YouTube? He's been blowing up on YouTube. The Bull. No, <laughs> I uh, no, I uh, I uh, you know that guy, you know. You can't you can't ever fault the guy for what they do, but you know maybe it's about time you you know you're like 80 years old now. Just just lay it down, relax a little bit. You know what I mean? You've been in the you know I don't know what he could do for himself. You know what I mean? But God yeah. bless him. He's uh, I wish him nothing but the best. But I'm gonna take a look at that now that you mentioned that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. for the people watching this, then Bruno. Is there any way you would like people to support you or contact you? I know you do inspirational talks to prisoners and young people. Is, is that the case? Any Anybody who'd like to uh, speak to me and, uh, you know, uh, anything that I could do for anybody to help them. Um, I know I touched on it a little bit in our emails, but... You know, thank God, Sean, uh, after I got out, I, I want to tell you, if we have time, I want to tell yeah. you what changed my life. Please do. Yeah, go and, for it. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you oh, I found God in prison because, you know, people do that. That's great. But I was uh, I was in Colorado and uh, the the white boy faction there didn't like the fact that I was Italian and, you know, I was from uh, Arizona and uh Needless to say, you know me, Sean, I didn't care what anybody thought. Long story short, uh, I had I had fought, thought it was six guys at first, probably four. They ran in on me, you know, you know how they do it. I did pretty good, but whole, my mother had been very sick and uh, she was home on, uh, she had just come out of a convalescent you know she had copd which is a breathing disorder anyway uh it was september 15 2011 i was sitting in this hall i was all lumped up and uh, i had a chaplain knock on the window of my door and he says hey ackerson your mother's dead you want a phone call And I, I, I thought I heard him wrong, and I, I got up to the door, and I said, what did you say to me? He says, your mother's dead. You want a phone call? So, you know, I'll save all the uh, all the back and forth I had, but that was the moment that I decided that I was never going to see the inside of a jail, a prison, never going to have a pair of handcuffs on again because I basically right there and then lost lost every bit of support I ever had in my life, you know? Mm. Uh, I got out and uh, got out with $20 in my pocket, Sean. I didn't have E from the first time, so I didn't get that 50 bucks. And from there, uh, seven years ago, um, I became a crane operator. I went back with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Uh, I married a beautiful woman that loves me and still doesn't understand what I'm talking about as she's <laughs> sitting here watching me. And uh, I just built my own home in Mississippi where I live next door to my brother and my family. My daughter's having a baby. Uh, she's married to an airman in the Air Force. So my life is really good today, brother. You really. deserve it. You deserve it after everything you've been through, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, so what anybody was anybody that wants to go ahead? Um, 
Anyone who wants to, to reach out to you? Absolutely. We'll put Absolutely. some, we'll put, we'll put some. They need. If I could help somebody get through something. We'll, we'll put your contact details below this video. What, what was, what was it like then? What was Colorado versus Arizona? Like the, the, the system, is it a lot different? Country club. Really? Country club, <laughs> all brand new stuff and jails were pretty and the food was good. You had three meals a day and wow. yeah, it was night and day, night and day, night and day till you got to prison. And then there was, uh, I don't know if you heard about this. You do that true crime stuff, but um, so I get in there. I'm going to tell you this story, get in there and the jail was beautiful, you know, and uh, get ready to go to prison. They give you all brand new shirts and everything nice and pretty. Then I was introduced to a group called the 211 crew, which is the white boy crew in Colorado. Well, um, long story short, I'll save all those stories, but if you read up on it, they actually killed the director of corrections dad did you ever read that story about oh no. what was that about one of those uh well uh that faction in there whatever they were i did that they wanted to kill the, the uh guys to uh dress as a pizza delivery man they went to the guy's house and shot him dead in his front door so as a whole nother whole nother story sean oh my goodness part three yeah because some of the guys i knew before i got arrested those are ma guys they tried to do something similar to the head of the arizona department of corrections there was a big news story about that as well but they didn't get him correct yeah well, these guys succeeded these guys succeeded it so wow yeah it was uh and i was i was there when all that went down so it was uh yeah you know, they weren't very happy with uh with any any of us so yeah but, i'm sure the yeah. viewers and, and the people who've read hard time are curious as to what happened to roscoe aka marco and uh carlo aka hugo do you know what happened to them um carlo Oh, I don't know what happened to him. Um, I know that, I don't know if you remember, but I ended up having to get rid of him at, at the end there. Do you remember? No, I, I remember you, you, your anger problem and you're you having an argument with him and all that stuff. I got an anger problem. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, England, are you serious right now? <laughs> that really did happen. That really did. I, I hope everybody who's watching this and I hope everybody who's read your book realizes that you didn't tell one word of lie in there about anything. You know, it's stuff. It's not. It's all true. So what, why did he have to get turfed out? You know, I don't remember the exact situation. He did something or something about his background that me and Roscoe found out. You don't remember we we sent him packing. We didn't beat him up. Yeah. We sent him packing. He was crying oh. because he was pleading his case from Roscoe. I don't know if you remember that, but I want to I want to remember the whole story before I tell you the whole story. But he ended up leaving. But yeah, as far as as far as Roscoe was concerned, um, until I started talking to you. Um, I was like, wow, let me, let me, let me see where this guy's at. So I Googled him and uh, came up some kind of court case. And then of course I went on the Arizona DOC and looked him up and it turns out the man is doing life in prison. Uh, he got convicted back in 2013, I believe for uh, two conspiracies to commit murder. So. And you sent me a picture. Up. And then of course I've, uh, I've sent a letter to him to see, you know, what's what, but I haven't heard back from him yet. Yeah, you sent me a picture of him, man. I almost cried when I saw him. Just all the memories just came back from Little Italy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So anything else you'd like to tell the people watching this then about you and your life and your experiences and for the young people to stay away from this shit? I, uh, I got to tell you, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to look back on, you know, things that we've done. It's good to look, you know, and, and laugh about it now like we are. But if I could reach one person and make their life, you know, change to the point where they never have to go through one minute of one day that we went through, I would do it in a second. Uh, for younger people, you know, uh, it's hard to reach people that don't want to be heard. But uh, there's a better way and a better life. You and I, Sean, we're, uh, we're exceptions to the rule because, you know, one, out of two, one or two out of 100,000 that went back 55 times and are not able to uh, have a life and live well. And, you know, life's good, man. And uh, we're very lucky and blessed to be where we are today. Yeah, that even though the conditions are extreme, it does make you appreciate your life when you get it back. Absolutely. And uh, I, I have struggles every single day. Um, you know, uh, uh, PTSD and all this other stuff that they talk about these days, you know, everything's got a label now and everything, you know, my experience has made me who I am. And, uh, you know, Nobody'd fault us, bro, for being a serial killer after coming out and doing, you know, the time that we did. But I think um, everything that we went through and everything that we did and everything that happened to us, you know, forms us and conditions us to what we are today. And I think I'm a pretty nice guy now. Um, I never, never lost my heart, but, you know, how to adapt to what, you know, we were dealing with with and same thing with you you have an age today you haven't you you look the same as the first day i met you and honestly you know you can see look at how happy you are you're you're smiling you were the same way in there then 20 years ago so that says something for our mental strength you yeah know, you look exactly the same too man proud of you yeah of you, Sean. oh thank you appreciate that brother yeah so look, man, you, you're welcome back anytime. I know this is just going to get us such no a fantastic problem. response. People have been reading Hard Time all over the world. And the Little Italy chapter is the one that just stands out so much. So I, I'm just so honored and privileged that we've we've reunited and you've come on and, and spoke to me like this. And, you know, would love to get you back anytime, brother. 20 plus years, you must have a book in you. You must have so many stories. So... And it's just been an absolute delight just to see you after all these years, my friend. I do. Same here. Same list. And I'm so happy to, you know, just do what I can. And it's an honor for me to be in your presence, brother. I thank you for having me on. And uh, we'll talk. I promise you keep in touch and if you ever want to hear any more of my stories or anything more uh i'd love to come back thank you yeah and thanks for watching this then to the viewers and if you would like to reach out to bruno or if you want him to do an inspirational talk for you then his contact details will be below this video please let us know in the comments what it has been like today to actually see in real life one of the stars from little italy <laughs> take care out there everybody Thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Thank you.